Before I take your questions, uh, let me uh, offer a few things. First, uh, the President earlier today had another uh, update on the shutdown and uh, the uh, issue of the need to raise the debt ceiling. Uh, again, uh, the participants in that meeting were the Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Sylvia Burwell, and Deputy Chief of Staff, Alyssa Mastromonaco. The President, as you know, met with members of the Financial Services Forum, the President and the Vice President did, and I think you had an opportunity to uh, hear from some of them at the stakeout not long ago, uh, and I hope you took note of what was said. Furthermore, the President will meet with uh, the four leaders of Congress at 5.30 p.m. today in the Oval Office with the Vice President. The Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, will, in that meeting, uh, brief the leaders on what were the impacts of the threat of default in 2011 and the uh, economic imperative for Congress to act to raise the debt ceiling without the threat of default and without delay and drama uh, uh, shortly. With that, I'll take your questions. Any coverage on that? Uh, it's a meeting with the leaders. No football? Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything for you on that, more. Thanks, Jay. Um, the meeting today, is that something we should be looking at as a negotiation on the government shutdown, or is this more about the President gathering these leaders in the Oval Office to just tell them what we've heard from him publicly over the past few days? I think I can answer your question this way. A negotiation, in the Washington sense, traditionally implies give and take, trade-offs, demands, uh, you know, if you give me this, I'll take that, I'll give, I'll give you that. The President's approach from the beginning in this uh, is that he's asking for nothing, nothing from Republicans. He is attaching zero demands to the general proposition that Congress should simply open the government, keep it open. He's asking for nothing. He is making no demands. He is attaching no partisan strings to his request that Congress fulfill its responsibility to ensure that the United States does not default on its obligations for the first time in our long history. So in that sense, no, the President is not going to sit down and start asking for puts and takes. He's not going to engage in that kind of negotiation because he does not want uh, to hold or have held the, the openness of the government, the functioning of the government, or the world and American economy hostage to a series of demands. Uh, you know, what the President is asking the Congress to do, what the President is asking Republicans in the House to do, is quite literally the least they could do. He is asking them to extend funding at the levels set in the previous fiscal year to keep the government open. That's the least they could do. And the Speaker of the House should hold a vote on that proposition and see what happens. If he's convinced that a majority, that all of his Republicans in his conference will vote no to opening the government to a clean CR in Washington speak, to just a bill that opens the government and funds it at the levels that it has been funded for the previous year, uh, then then we'll see what we do then. But my guess is, and the estimation of numerous observers and members of Congress of the Republican Party, is that if John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, who has this power alone, put on the floor of the House a bill to fund the government, to open it up, without partisan strings attached, it would pass overwhelmingly. I think you know that's true. I think every member of Congress knows it's true. Uh, and it reflects the simple fact that 
Unfortunately, the speaker won't do that because he is uh, responding to the demands of one faction of one party in one house of one branch of government, and everyone is paying the price of that decision. So that position of the president is pretty well known at this point. So if he's not uh, budging off of that, going to this meeting, what's the purpose of having the congressional leaders here? Uh, look, the president said, uh, and he is true to his word, that he would be having conversations with the leaders of the Congress about the essential need to keep the government open, or now in this case to reopen the government, and to uh, ensure that we do not default. Uh, and he will have that conversation. And uh, you know, we look. We all realize he, you know this has put the Republicans. You know, they've gotten themselves in a box here in the House, and it's put them in a uh, difficult position. And they're under a lot of pressure. A lot of it applied by Republicans. Uh, and there's a simple way out. Do the Democratic thing. Pass a bill. See if it can win a majority. Put a bill on the floor. See if a majority votes yes. Be surprised and delighted by the fact that a number of your own Republicans would vote yes. By some estimates, quite a number of them. Take that as a win uh, and move on. And then we can uh, ensure that the government doesn't, uh, rather that the economy doesn't default, the United States doesn't default. Uh, we raise the debt ceiling in an orderly fashion without drama and delay. And then we can go about debating and discussing and negotiating our budget priorities. How do we move forward? How do we fund the government in a way that assures that our economy continues to grow, that the, uh, the, the jobs that have been created thus far in this uh, recovery, seven and a half million private sector jobs, are added to uh, as, soon, as quickly as possible with more private sector jobs? Uh, and you know, put to votes you know, different propositions about how we should do that. Have negotiations, discussions, put it to a vote. Uh, but do not, I mean, it is profoundly undemocratic for, uh, you know, one faction of one party to say, I didn't get what I wanted through the normal legislative process. I didn't get what I wanted uh, <coughs> through the Supreme Court. I didn't get what I wanted when the American people nationally voted. And so I will therefore hold the government hostage and the economy hostage uh, in order to achieve my aims. Uh, I don't think that's good for our democracy, and it's certainly not good for our economy. And I think you heard uh, Lloyd Blankfein, who's the head of the Financial Services Forum, you know, say that you cannot use U.S. obligations to repay its debt as a cudgel. Uh, and there's a consensus, this is again, uh, quoting him based on reports I've seen, I was not out at the stakeout, but there's a consensus that we shouldn't do anything to hurt this recovery. And that's a consensus among, you know, CEOs who might not otherwise all agree politically with the president, because this isn't about, that shouldn't be about partisan politics. We well, keep the government open, we pay our bills. We yes. move on to the Asia trip. Um, oh, come on. It was, I was, it was <laughs> just getting started. <laughs> You'll have plenty of other opportunities, I'm sure. Um, the cancellation of the two stops was presented as sort of a logistical decision. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's also any concern here about just the optics of having the president be abroad during a shutdown and when the final decision on the Indonesia and Brunei legs needs to be made by. Well, you're right that it was a logistical decision related to the shutdown, and it was because of where uh, assets were and people were and the fact that they had not been deployed to those two countries where th which were scheduled to be at the back end of the trip, and therefore because of the shutdown it made it uh, logistically necessary to cancel those two stops. We had assets and personnel in the first two countries, uh, and as of now we, uh, you know, continue to intend, we intend to have the President make those uh, you know, make that make that trip because uh, it is important. It is make that trip whether or not the government is shut down. Look, on we we Saturday. think well. Again, I'm not going to get spin ahead to Saturday, and we'll obviously evaluate this as uh, each day goes by. You know, if the speaker were to do what I just talked about, we could the government would be up and running by uh, uh, by dinner time. So, uh, so there remains the opportunity here for that. You know, hypothetical to be moot, 
and we hope that it is because you know it's an important uh, responsibility of a president to uh, uh, travel and conduct uh, foreign policy to conduct uh, discussions about economic growth and uh, investment uh, in the United States in our economy that creates jobs uh, you know the, the the two summits that are taking place in uh, Indonesia and Brunei uh, you know, offer opportunities both economic opportunities and security opportunities to the United States uh, and that's why uh, you know, a trip like this for any president uh, is useful and important to the American economy and the American people so uh, I can't give you a prediction about what things will look like Saturday except to say that I hope, uh, you know, the majority has an opportunity to speak in the House of Representatives. Yes? Jay, why did the President wait until the second day of the shutdown to call this meeting with congressional leaders? <laughs> the second day. Well, he spoke with the Speaker uh, not long ago. He's made clear his views. Uh, you know, what we've seen over the past 10 days is the Republicans being quite involved uh, with their own internal politics. and. Uh, you know, with uh, digressions in the Senate and, uh, you know, uh, dictates from one body to the other about what the proper course of action should be. Uh, and, uh, you know, the President, again, has had discussions with leaders. He looks forward to the discussion today. Uh, but unfortunately, as I mentioned yesterday, he does not, uh, despite the awesome power and responsibility of the Presidency of the United States, uh, have the power to uh, order up a simple vote to see if it gets a majority on the floor of the House of Representatives. That is a power that the Speaker of the House has in our democracy, and, and he should exercise it. And I think he would be surprised by, based on reports from Republicans, uh, what the outcome would be. He might even be able to claim he got a majority of his majority uh, or something close to it. So we won't know unless he does it. What we're absolutely sure would happen is that a majority of the House of Representatives would vote to open the government in five minutes if given the opportunity. If the President was willing to let the government shut down uh, in response to House Republican demands to alter the Affordable Care Act, would he be willing to let the country go into default instead of... I, I, I completely uh, uh, have to dispute the, the way you framed that question. He's not willing. He's not, he is not the party to this that is making extraneous partisan demands. He's asking for nothing from the Republicans. He thinks it would be wrong. As I said the other day, he could, uh, if he were playing that game, that small game, that game that does not look at the interests of the United States but looks at partisan interests, uh, he, would, he would attach, he'd say, you know what, we need to, uh, this is my opportunity, even though I haven't built a consensus yet for it, to, uh, uh, you know, eliminate, for example, the subsidies for oil and gas companies that taxpayers pay. You know that's been something he thinks is the right thing to do. Uh, he knows that you know that that's something he's asked Congress to vote on. You know that's something that Republicans have uh, rejected and successfully prevented from becoming law that he could sign. But if he took the Republican tactic and basically tried to circumvent uh, normal democratic process here, he would say, I'm not going to open the government. You know, I, I would refuse to sign a clean, I, would, I wouldn't sign a clean CR. I would only sign it if it if it had my partisan demands attached to it or my personal uh, principled demands attached to it. But he won't do that. He will not play the game that Republicans are playing, which is a game that has as its principal uh, victims uh, hardworking Americans who are home now, uh, wondering when they get to go back to work, wondering if they'll ever get paid uh, for this time off. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, even more frightening, you know, folks out there, including the CEOs who were here today, uh, wondering what the world economy and the American economy would look like if we defaulted for the first time. Because we know one thing, it would not look pretty. The impacts would be catastrophic, according to the IMF and others. Uh, but uh, since it's never happened, uh, we don't know quite how catastrophic it would be. And we do, not, we do not want to and we should not even contemplate uh, trying to find out. On the Asia trip, um, would, it be, uh, would the President not go if the government is still shut down? What would uh, cause him to either decide well, to Well, as not I said to, to Julie, we don't uh, believe that's a decision that needs to be made now. That's speculation as uh, there's an opportunity for the House uh, Speaker to place on the floor now, hold a vote, see how the majority uh, <coughs> 
responds, see how the majority votes. And uh, if it, uh, as we expect, uh, votes to open the government without partisan strings attached, then uh, your question is answered. So we'll see. Sure. Mara. I, I just have a question. Up until now, you've said the president is willing to negotiate on the budget, and he's even willing to entertain uh, ideas for improving mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we see these talks as that kind of negotiation as opposed to negotiating on the things you don't want to negotiate? Because they're not about that. He will not negotiate. He will not offer concessions to Republicans in exchange for not tanking the economy. No, so that, that. so today's, today's meeting is about uh, the need to open the government and the need to ensure that we do not default. And the President's made clear that he will uh, that he is happy and willing, as he has been all year round, all year long, uh, to engage in serious uh, conversations and negotiations with Republican lawmakers who want to find common ground on our budget <laughs> challenges. Absolutely willing to. What he is not willing to do is uh, negotiate uh, under the threat of default or under the threat of continuing to shut down the government. Congress has a responsibility to open the government. Again, there is. Republicans have had ample opportunity to uh, repeal, defund, delay, dismantle, undermine the Affordable Care Act. Ample opportunity. And they have taken advantage of that opportunity and voted, I've lost count, 40 plus times. Each time they have not succeeded. Uh, but, you know, hope springs eternal, I guess, and they can keep doing it. But. But one way to do it, as I think you know, some people wrote about today, is to continue to argue your case, take it to the people, see what they say when they vote uh, in the next election, see what they say when they vote in the next presidential election, uh, and then pass legislation. But just because you can't get what you want through the American democratic process doesn't mean you should subvert that po process to achieve what you want. When you're a minority within one party in one house, of one branch of government. It's, it's, it's just wrong. It's bad. The American people don't deserve this. But the serious conversations that you're willing to have, is that what's going to happen today? Or does, does, no, does the I, plan I, CR have to be passed I, before those serious conversations can correct. begin? Okay. Correct. The, the president is not going to negotiate after. about okay. you know, how we can uh, come to an agreement on our budget challenges, how we can uh, come to an agreement about funding necessary priorities to ensure that we grow our economy and ensure that the middle class is protected and expanding, ensure that our kids are getting the best education possible, and then ensure that we reduce our deficit uh, in a responsible way, as we have been doing, by the way, since President Obama took office. Um, you know, that's, that, the President has been willing to do that all year long, and he has reached out, as you guys reported on uh, repeatedly, uh, to Republicans who have been uh, at least uh, who suggested they were open to finding that common ground, who, who suggested they were open to making the same kind of compromises that the President proved he was willing to, willing to make. Uh, but he won't negotiate on behalf of the American people uh, and the economy. He will not uh, negotiate uh, under threat of sh continuing to keep the government shut down or defaulting on our obligations for the first time. It is, uh, you know, the pre precedent here when it comes to default would be monumental and monumentally bad for the future of the American economy. Uh, imagine what uh, this process would look like if every time the debt ceiling needed to be raised, a minority of uh, one party's representation, if one house, could dictate to the president of whichever party demands they couldn't achieve through the congressional process, the legislative process, and if they didn't get what they wanted, they they tank the world economy. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's the, the wrong thing to do. Happen in tandem. Biden no. talks to McConnell even while they're threatening a shutdown it, or a default. Again, Mara, and I know you know this. There has been one occasion in our history since the debt ceiling was in place when a participant to negotiations used the real and tangible threat of default as part of those negotiations in raising the debt ceiling, and that was in 2011, and we saw the consequences, and they were concrete and they were very negative and that was simply the threat of default prior to that uh, the debt ceiling was raised without 
the threat of default without drama or delay. And uh, that is how it should be, because uh, it's too serious a matter to uh, suggest that we should leave open to question around the world uh, whether the United States of America will pay its bills, whether, you know, treasuries that investors buy or sovereign governments buy uh, are, are ever going to be repaid. Can I, can I follow up just on uh, See. Um, are you saying then that the President wouldn't accept a, a solution which reopens the government that doesn't deal with the debt ceiling issue at the same time? I, I don't think I said that. I said, look, the, the, if the uh, House voted today, if John Boehner decided to let the majority speak and vote and be heard, uh, and they voted today to uh, open the government, as I'm sure they would, uh, then they ought to uh, move very quickly to ensure that the debt ceiling was raised without drama and delay. Our position has not been uh, to negotiate the mechanics by which they do it. They should just do it without making any threats and uh, without uh, uh, attaching partisan demands to it. Do you remember anything on these um, U.S. diplomats who were expelled from Venezuela, supposedly um, meeting the <coughs> right do. Um, first of all, we completely reject the Venezuelan government's allegations that U.S. diplomats were in any way involved in some type of conspiracy to destabilize the Venezuelan government. Our officials were conducting normal diplomatic engagement, and as we've said many times, we maintain regular contact with people across the Venezuelan political spectrum. This action by the Venezuelan government is clearly an effort to distract from its domestic problems and is not a serious way for a country to conduct its foreign policy. As the State Department has said, the United States has taken reciprocal action by declaring three Venezuelan officials persona non grata Rate, rather, including the Venezuelan Charge de Affairs and a secretary, uh, second secretary at their embassy here in Washington, uh, and the Venezuelan consul in Houston. I'd refer you uh, to the State Department for further details about the actions we've taken. Um, you know, we would like to reach the point where we are able to make progress on areas of mutual interest, like counter-narcotics, counter-terrorism, and economic and commercial ties. But getting there would require a demonstration of seriousness on the part uh, of the Venezuelan government in Caracas. Okay. Bloomberg. A uh, couple of non-shutdown questions related to health care. Wow. Sort of a big deal, yeah. me, actually. Um, sure. <coughs> sure is. Uh, New York said that they are looking into abnormally high traffic on their site yesterday. 10 million page hits in a state with only 20 million people. Is there any evidence or concern that either state or federal exchanges have been the victims of hacking campaigns, perhaps in an attempt to stymie them? Or oh, I, I have not heard that. I mean, I would refer you, obviously, to New York for whatever uh, they may be looking at and to HHS. I mean, I think uh, what we uh, are confident of is that the high volume we've seen around the country, the 4.7 million unique visitors uh, in the first 24 hours to healthcare.gov, uh, reflects the uh, extreme interest in uh, the opening of the marketplaces and the uh, opening of the opportunity for uh, individuals to shop for and select affordable health insurance for the first time. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, I said yesterday, it's a first class problem. There's no question that uh, the volume was so high and continues to be so high that uh, that has, uh, you know, caused some delays, uh, uh, but it is related to, th those delays are in our view related to the high volume, and, and, and we are working on them uh, uh, to ensure that uh, they're fixed and the process becomes more and more smooth for uh, visitors to the website every day. In a similar vein, the people who cover health care for us tell me that this morning there were still long wait times at exchanges. What is the level of concern, or is there any concern that this will discourage people, especially young adults? <laughs> who are key to the success of the program and who at least some think are, would be more easily discouraged by that? Well, I'd say two things. It is, as I mentioned, uh, a good problem to have, that uh, interest uh, in these first two days exceeds what we anticipated. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have uh, an extremely competent team uh, that developed a very user-friendly website, and they are working uh, on uh, these problems every day and the, and the process uh, gets uh, improved every day. Uh, 
it's important to remember, in answer to your question, that this is a six-month process and we're in the second day. Uh, there uh, are something like 180 days left uh, for people to enroll. And anybody who experienced difficulties or delays in getting on the site yesterday or browsing or enrolling should know that they can enroll any any time from today through December and still uh, have their insurance kick in on January 1st. That's when that's the earliest that insurance will kick in. So for these first several months, when people enroll, they are enrolling uh, for the opportunity to have their insurance available on January 1st. And then the entire enrollment process lasts six months. So uh, we welcome the interest. We think it's a reflective of the fact that there are millions of Americans out there who want better options, more affordable options for health care coverage, and uh, the Affordable Care Act is providing that, and these marketplaces are providing it. I mean, I, if you're an individual and you're looking at these, you're going on to healthcare.gov and you check out the, the plans available in your state for you, uh, there are on average uh, more than 50 options. So take some time to review them, and everyone should make a considered choice about what plan is right for them and what plan fits their finances and what subsidies are available to them if they have low incomes. Uh, and uh, you know that's how the process is supposed to work. And I think it's worth noting that this is what, at least putatively, this fight is about, right? Shut down the government, they say, the House Republicans, if you don't deprive these 4.7 million Americans who at least had an interest in healthcare.gov in the first 24 hours, and the millions of Americans who have the opportunity to purchase affordable health care, health insurance for the first time, of that opportunity. That's their position. Uh, and this has been litigated and debated. I saw one senator, one well-known senator of the Republican Party who said, uh, there, you know, Obamacare hasn't been debated. I don't know where he was uh, when this debate went on for months on Capitol Hill. Uh, and it has, since passage, of course, continued and been the subject of uh, election debates and uh, legislative actions and judicial actions and Supreme Court action. Uh, so I think it's been debated. And it is certainly entirely appropriate and fine with the President and the rest of us, rest of us if opponents of Obamacare want to continue to press their case through the normal legislative process. And, uh, you know, that's how our democracy works. You, you, ha you take a position, you, you try to get that position adopted by as many people as you can in your legislative body, and you see if you can succeed in changing the law. Uh, and if you can't, uh, you go back to the drawing board, you can try to continue to build support for it, you, and then you have more elections, and you try to have more people who see it your way elected, and then you try to have a president who sees it your way elected. That's how it works. But just because you didn't get what you wanted at the polls, and you didn't get what you want out of Congress, and you didn't get what you want out of the Supreme Court, it is not the right thing to do to then say, well, then because I have this unique power and influence over my speaker, I'm going to tank the economy. I'm going to shut down the government. Uh, that's what they're arguing. That's their position. And that's why there is so much heat on Republicans now. That's why there is so much of the story we're seeing now is uh, Republicans saying, this is bad for the American people, bad for the middle class, bad for the economy, and bad for the Republican Party. Chris. Jay, thanks. Going back to this meeting, if the President's not going to negotiate, as you have said, what will he say or what can he say today during this meeting to move this process forward and try to break this stalemate? He will, uh, I'm sure, uh, express uh, what I have just expressed, which is his uh, concern about the impacts of a shutdown, his concern about the devastating impacts of even the threat of default uh, and the uh, catastrophic impacts of uh, default itself. And he will, I think, ask uh, the leaders to consider uh, the fact that he's making no demands of them in this process. He's attaching no uh, demands to uh, any pro proposed legislation that would open the government at current levels, like these are not, these are not levels that the president set or that the president asked for. These are current levels of spending, no increases, and then he's asking for uh, the Congress to simply uh, authorize the Treasury to pay the bills that the Congress has already charged. I mean, this would be like on default, uh, and I've thought about it, this a lot lately. 
you make a purchase on your credit card, the moment you do that, because you have a contract with the credit card company, you have incurred debt. The bill comes due in a month. And if you don't pay that bill, you have defaulted. Uh, but in paying that bill, you have not incurred new debt. You are simply paying what you owe. And Congress has authorized uh, spending, uh, both through uh, annual discretionary appropriations and through mandatory, mandatory programs. And because of those legal obligations that Congress has established, uh, we have debts that we must pay. And Congress is proposing, the House Republicans are proposing, that if they don't get to take insurance away from millions of Americans, they won't let the United States pay their, its bills. But Jay, the President's made those arguments and the process hasn't moved forward, so I guess the question is what's going to be different about this Again, conversation? Again, we can't force uh, House Republicans uh, to vote the way we think they should. Uh, we, uh, the President can and he will uh, make the case for why it's the right and responsible thing to do. He will make clear to them uh, and uh, uh, his willingness his year-long willingness, his presidency-long willingness to sit down and try to find compromise with Republicans on budget priorities and ways to reduce our deficit in a responsible manner. And, uh, but he won't, you know, he won't allow the American economy and the American middle class to be held hostage to the partisan demands of a minority within one house of one branch of government. Jay, is it appropriate for the President and members of Congress to still be getting paid while 800,000 workers have been furloughed? Look, the law stipulates how this works. Understand Our view right. is the government ought to be open. The but government the ought to be step open. step forward and say I'm going to <coughs> withhold my pay while well, this let's, let's, let's be, shutdown let, continues? Let, let's be clear about how, I mean, it's important to understand this is not uh, like the furloughs caused by, uh, you know, in, in previous issues. People who are accepted and are working are not paid, uh, but they are guaranteed that they will be paid. Uh, you know, elected members, I believe, are guaranteed that they will be paid or are currently being paid by law. Uh, then there are those who are being uh, furloughed across the government. Uh, and of course, it would take an act of Congress for uh, them to be paid for the time that they were laid off because of the shutdown, or they were furloughed because of the shutdown. And we certainly hope Congress would do that. Uh, but uh, you know, it is, our, our view is the shutdown ought to end right now when John Banner puts to, the, uh, puts to a vote a clean CR and gets a substantial majority with both uh, Republicans and Democrats voting aye. Uh, and then they, they should, as part of that, uh, make sure that those who uh, don't know whether they'll be paid uh, are made whole again. And that should happen, if it happens today, that's great. If it happens tomorrow, that's great. But in any case, we would envision that as the right thing to do. I just think that part of the frustration with Washington revolves around that point. And I understand what you're saying, but I know that you're aware of the fact that some people are concerned about making ends meet um, while their pay is being withheld. So what would you say to those people who say Washington's not working? So why are we the ones who are suffering? Well, I would say that that's why it's so important for Congress to do the right thing and attach no partisan demands to a simple vote to open the government and ensure that uh, those hundreds of thousands of hardworking Americans, neighbors and fellow worshipers, you know, friends who are on the sidelines of our kids' baseball and soccer games, uh, you know, have the security of knowing that the paycheck is coming. I just have one more on Jamie Dimon. Um, mm -hmm. He has been meeting with the DOJ to work out a deal. Um, over uh, his bank's dealings during the financial crisis. Is there any concern about a conflict of interest of President Obama meeting with him today? I would refer you to the Department of Justice. Obviously, he uh, was here as part of the Financial Services Forum, which was in uh, town. And, Does uh, the President have any concern about that? Again, he met with the President with part of this uh, group of CEOs from the financial services industry. Yeah, Mark. Jay, House Republicans are willing to vote funding to reopen national parks museums, <laughs> memorials, uh, veterans' mm -hmm. payments, and uh, the D.C. government. Mm -hmm. why, why is the White House against it? Because why it, not take it's, what you it, can get? It's because that's not how this works. It's a gimmick, and it is unsustainable, and it's not serious. And the lack of seriousness in their approach has been just demonstrated again and again and again, uh, and this is uh, yet the latest iteration of that. If they think that those functions ought to be open, vote to open the government. We're not asking anything from them. Democrats are not asking anything from them 
in return for making that simple vote. Uh, they ought to, you know, uh, the, the, the people that Kristen was just talking about, let, let, let's, let's <laughs> send them back to work. They're our neighbors, they're our friends. <coughs> they go to church and synagogue with us. They're, you know, they're good people who deserve the security of being able to work for their families and knowing they can pay the bills. Uh, and you know, all the various uh, effects of the shutdown, both large and small, uh, both serious and just inconvenient, can be resolved in a minute if the Speaker of the House holds a vote. What's he afraid of? Is he, af is he, is he afraid that uh, you know, 250, 300 you know, members of the House of Representatives will vote to open the government without partisan strings attached, without uh, the insistence of the Tea Party that they get to uh, dismantle a law that's Pass both houses and been signed and upheld by the Constitution and litigated in an election. You know what's what? What is the fear here? What is the problem with uh, simply allowing members of the House to vote on opening the government, the whole government? Well, Speaker Boehner says one of the issues you haven't addressed is the fairness issue that some people and some groups have been getting uh, um, waivers and uh, delays on uh, their mandates in Obamacare, but individuals haven't. Mm -hmm. If he brings that up uh, at the meeting today, what will the president tell him? Well, first of all, that suggestion, as we've discussed for a long time, is absurd. I mean, that Speaker Boehner and the, 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 the folks who are trying to undo and kill Obamacare any way they can uh, are not interested in improving it or delaying it to make it better. They're interested in uh, doing what they've said all along, which is to, to repeal it, get rid of it. Uh, there's that. But the fact is, uh, the Affordable Care Act is here to stay. It is being implemented as we speak. For the past three years, the benefits of uh, the Affordable Care Act have already been felt by millions of Americans, by seniors, by families who have their, uh, you know, kids up to the age of 26 now on their insurance policies, by, uh, you know, millions of Americans who have gotten rebates from insurance companies because of the provision within the Affordable Care Act that uh, makes it the law that these insurance companies uh, spend a, a certain percentage of those premiums on health care and not on uh, CEO salaries and advertising and other administrative costs. So, uh, you know, you know that's a ruse. We know that's a ruse. The President is certainly interested in having discussions about how to improve the Affordable Care Act to make it better uh, as it provides insurance options for the first time to millions of Americans. Uh, but. You know, the, 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 the call to delay the individual responsibility provision, the individual mandate, that's, a, that's an attempt to get rid of Obamacare because everyone knows, who knows anything about how the system works, uh, that provision is essential to ensuring that every member in your family who has a pre-existing condition cannot be told by the insurance companies that they're out of luck. Remember the consequences of this policy position, and, and we can debate it, and we should, in elections and in on the floor of the House and Senate through the normal means. Uh, but it is completely inappropriate to try to get what you could not get through the normal democratic process uh, by threatening the faith and credit of the United States uh, or threatening to keep the government shut down. Jay, did you not open the door, though, to that piecemeal approach <coughs> that Mark is referring to when the President signed into law allowing men and women in uniform to be paid while this happens? Now the Republicans are saying, well, then why not also pay out veteran benefits and other things? You did open the door at least a little bit to some people being paid. The President believes, as obviously uh, virtually everyone in Congress believes, that our men and women in uniform uh, need the uh, reassurance that we here in Washington have their backs, and just like they have ours. Uh, and that is why uh, he signed that bill. There is no question that there, is, there are problems created by the government being shut down. There is no question that there are inconveniences and real hardship. And if Republicans are sincerely concerned uh, about those problems, they have an option here, which is to vote to open the government. Full stop. Just do it. Don't, you know, it, you know the, 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 the theatrics and the, uh, you know, the gimmicks only cause delay when the option is available to put a simple bill on the floor that keeps the government open at spending levels set 
uh, in the previous fiscal year. So they didn't shut the government down over those spending levels a week ago. They didn't say a month ago, this is unacceptable, we're shutting it down. So why this week? Why, why are the spending levels from last year suddenly so unacceptable that they'd shut the government down with all the negative consequences thereof because they are on an ideological crusade and because the party has been hijacked by uh, a faction within it. And I say that quoting Republicans. I say that uh, not to score a point, but to make an observation that I think is widely held here by people of both parties and people who are independent observers. And, it's, and it has a, a negative impact on the normal functioning of our democracy. When you talk about theatrics, one of the flashpoints in this has become what happened yesterday and it's something that played out again today apparently at the World War II <coughs> Memorial here in Washington. Rather than just airing, there's allegations from Republicans at the White House, you know, broadly speaking, somehow ordered this, put up barricades to prevent veterans from getting there. Rather than going through all of that, mm -hmm. can you please tell us from the podium what is your version of what happened? The government shut down when the House Republicans decided to shut it down. And, and every House Republican who has decried any impact from this shutdown, as if they were surprised that it would happen, uh, clearly didn't pay attention when every agency of the federal government posted on their websites on Friday what would happen if the government were shut down, including the closing of national memorials and national parks. Uh, I mean, on the very night that they voted to shut down the government, some of the most vocal uh, cr critics of this particular matter were quoted saying, we got what we wanted. Well, apparently you did. Look, we honor our World War II veterans, and I would point you to, uh, you know, the decisions made and the actions being taken by the Department of the Interior and the National Park Service to ensure that these honor flight participants are able to have access to that memorial. But the fact is, uh, you know, when you shut down the government, you, you know, you shut down a lot of services. You, you, you lay off a lot of people, and there are uh, you know, bad consequences to that. So there, if, 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 if any member of Congress who, you know, got in front of a television camera to try to get some attention on this issue spent half that time on the floor of the House voting to open the government, we wouldn't have a problem. But so can you explain, are there some, uh, the honor the veterans, are they now allowed to see the memorial? You said there, there are accommodations being made. If on one hand you're saying, look, the government shut down, tough luck, the Republicans haven't voted to open it, but then on the other hand you're saying we are making accommodations, what is really happening then? Well, Department of the Interior and the National Park Service obviously are the sources for more specific information, but uh, the DOI has made an accommodation uh, for the honor flights and will grant access to the World War II Memorial. Uh, the DOI has granted a permit for the veterans that is consistent with the existing closure order. DOI will remain in contact with the Honor Flight Organization to ensure that veterans scheduled to travel to D.C. are provided access to the memorial. memorial rather. Um, you know, my understanding is that the closure order provides a process for accepting First Amendment activities on National Mall and Memorial Parks uh, in D.C. and in Philadelphia. Uh, and again, for more, uh, uh, you know, more detail on on that process that is going to allow access for these uh, veterans and heroes, uh, I would refer you to uh, DOI and the National Park Service. Last thing, James Clapper was on the Hill today uh, at a hearing about NSA uh, issues and was asked by, I think, Senator Grassley whether or not the country is safe right now during the shutdown. He said, quote, I don't feel that I can make sure a guarantee to the American people. It will be much more difficult to make a guarantee as each day of the sh shutdown goes by. So I want to get your perspective. Is this is the country less safe now, or is this James Clapper trying to scare people to put pressure on Republicans? Look, I would just point you to the testimony of the uh, head of the DNI. I, uh, you know, but what we have said. That up. I, Are we less I, safe? I, well, I'm not the person charged with making that assessment. So I would, I would refer but you to the. Does the commander in chief believe that we are less safe? The commander in chief believes that we ought to open the government and that there are bad, you know, there are bad impacts. Uh, some of them quite serious, some of them just inconveniences from, you know, a partisan decision to shut the government down over, you know, peak about the fact that they haven't been able to do away with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and so, uh, but for, you know, we're, we're, we're focused on trying to undo this, trying to 
make clear that there's a simple way to do that, which is to have a vote and let the majority in the House decide, uh, and uh, so that we don't have to a day from now or a week from now or hopefully uh, two or three weeks from now not have a discussion about you know what has been the result, what have been the consequences of uh, a prolonged shutdown. John. Um, and just to button up that, he all, Clapper also said 70 percent of Intel analysts have been mm -hmm. furloughed. I mean, that's got to be a that's got to be a real concern. Well, I mean, again, I, I, a real national. I don't. Concern. You know, every agency is has uh, provided information, as I understand it, about what happens with uh, a shutdown, and and uh, you know, I would refer you to each agency, and again, for those agencies to make assessments about what the immediate effects of shutdown are. I, you know, I don't. I don't have any more in information on that than certainly the uh, director provided. And just to, to follow up on what um, Mara was talking to you about, the, I just want to be clear and understand the parameter, parameters of what's negotiable and, and what's not. Mm -hmm. um, the president would be willing to negotiate on a year-long budget, right? I mean, so if, if, if we went in, if, if, if this negotiation, members of Congress, co congressional leaders coming in here, uh, were to negotiate a, a year-long budget, the rest of the year, not none of the six-week stuff, but a year-long budget. I assume there'd be some give and take. <coughs> Could you negotiate that and then, you know, slap on the, uh, the, the raising the debt ceiling and, and, and be done with it? And, and the Republicans could pretend they were negotiating on debt ceiling, but, you know, as far as you would be concerned, you'd really be talking about the year-long budget? Well, I, the issue here is holding uh, up the threat of default if you don't get what you want. Uh, and that is uh, absolutely reckless and irresponsible. And as others have pointed out uh, in discussions we've had about efforts by Republicans to say it's somehow commonplace to make that threat uh, and has been over our history, there's no question that there have been different means by which uh, the debt ceiling has been raised that, you know, attached to different bills. So I, I, I'm not going to speculate about the mechanics of doing it. Our concern is just that it get done without drama or delay and without the threat of default. So that's one. Two, we have already shut, they have already, the Republicans in the House have already, you know, we are living under shutdown. They have already shut down the government. Um, it is, uh, you know, maybe in some uh, idealized Washington of 2013, we could negotiate a year-long budget compromise uh, in an hour or two. Uh, but the fact is, we need, the, you know, the Congress needs to, the Republicans need to open the government and remove the threat of default so that we can get about the business, which I'm sure will be contentious, uh, but hopefully successful if, you know, intense, uh, if everybody's sincere in their efforts, uh, to negotiate a longer uh, budget deal. And, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, how long it is and, and what it contains obviously will be decided by the process itself. But uh, right now, uh, the Republicans have shut down the government. Right now, we're roughly two weeks away from the first default in our history, uh, you know, the Republicans need to do the responsible thing. The president's not asking anything in return for them fulfilling these basic responsibilities. Uh, and, and then we can, and the president looks forward to, uh, you know, having discussions and debates and negotiations about how we move forward. If, if they agree to do this six-week deal, I mean, you're going to be right back where we are now in six weeks. I mean, doesn't it make sense to say, okay, let's do it all right now, let's do a year-long budget? And not again, under threat of continued shutdown and not under threat of default. So you're not open to that debate right now? You want debt ceiling <coughs> there raised is, and, There is no and scenario <coughs> under which it would be anything but bad for the economy to hold the economy hostage to the threat of default uh, while you're involved in negotiations over trying to get what you want uh, uh, in, our long -term, you know, in a long-term budget deal. That's the kind of damage to the economy that we can't afford. We saw what happened in 2011. It's reckless and irresponsible. It's wrong. And the only, like, you, you know, the sad part of it is, is that, you know, obviously there are some members on the Hill who think it's good for their personal politics, it's good for them in their districts, uh, and that's all they seem to care most about. Uh, but there's no question that at the broad level, nationally, it's terrible. It's terrible for the economy. It's terrible for the middle class. Just to be crystal clear, we should not consider today's meeting a negotiation. Uh, not in the sense that the president would make any demands on Congress in return for their willingness to simply do their jobs. Jay. Carol. I just want to clarify two things. Um, 
So the president's position is he won't negotiate on the, around the CR, and that the Congress, the House has to pass a clean CR, and then he'll be willing to negotiate. But then he also won't negotiate on the debt ceiling. So are you? I just are trying to get. Are you saying that any negotiations for something larger wouldn't be able to happen until after the debt ceiling was dealt with, not just the CR? I mean, again, how this plays out obviously depends on the actions that the Congress takes. But it is absolutely the president's position that you know he won't negotiate uh, under threat of default or continued shutdown of the government. Uh, you know, budget priorities because the Republicans are interested in holding the economy hostage and the middle class hostage to try to achieve through that process what they could not achieve through uh, Congress in the past, through the courts, or through the ballot box. Uh, and uh, having said that, the President is and has been and has demonstrated that he is uh, willing to have negotiations about you know, what, we sh what steps we should take to fund our government in a, in a way that allows us to invest in the future, protect the middle class, uh, you know, attract businesses to the United States and reduce our deficit in a responsible and balanced way. And, and the proof of that willingness is in the budget that he proposed, which everyone here acknowledged when you covered, I believe, well, there are probably a few people who didn't, but almost everybody here acknowledged when he released it, it was a serious document that represented compromises, that wasn't uh, you know, a wish list of partisan priorities, but was a demonstration of the President's willingness to try to meet Republicans uh, on common ground. And, you know, he hopes that Republicans will, uh, you know, meet him there, uh, but he's not willing to negotiate uh, over, uh, you know, Republican demands to collapse the world economy if they don't do away with affordable health insurance for the American people. Right. So it's fair to say that the President will not sit down and have those larger negotiations until there's a clean CR and a debt limit increase. Again, I think it's fair to say that the President will not negotiate over uh, Congress's responsibility to pay our bills, that he won't, and he will not make any demands of them. I mean, I think that it's, like, you know, you got you to gotta look at, turn the prism a little bit here, because the only party here that's making demands associated with opening the government, the only party here that's making demands associated with paying our bills is is the Republican Party and more narrowly the Tea Party. Uh, President Obama's not asking for uh, Republicans to, uh, again, do away with the uh, tax subsidies, the tax breaks that the oil and gas industry get in return for opening the government. He's not asking them to, um, you know, pass background checks, uh, something he believes passionately and in a principled way is the right thing to do, but he does not believe that uh, the right way to achieve that goal is by holding the economy hostage. Right. Can, one other thing on James Becker, he said that the shutdown seriously damages our ability to protect the safety and security of the country. And separately from believing that the House should pass a clean CR, is the White House looking to take any steps to address this particular concern? Again, as I said earlier, this, you know, the experts in all of these agencies can address what the impacts are of uh, the this shutdown. Is, I mean, the President has said that national security, the security of the American people is his number one priority. It is. So if you have James Clapper saying that the current shutdown seriously damages the <coughs> What the President to is the highly confident of is that if John Boehner were to allow a majority to vote on a clean CR, or to allow the House to vote at all, on a clean CR to open the government this afternoon, um, there would be no more negative impact. Isn't that essentially saying that his top priority is actually the shutdown and not the national the mm -hmm. national security of the country? No, it's not. The president is, of course, taking every step necessary as president to ensure the security of the American people. Uh, you know, there are consequences to shutdown, and they extend far beyond. Uh, you know, closures of parks and memorials or, uh, you know, other, other things that we've heard a lot about. And they, they affect those hundreds of thousands of people who have been furloughed and aren't getting a paycheck and don't know if and when they will. Uh, and that, uh, 
that's bad for the government, for the normal functioning of government. It provides services to the American people around the country, and it's, and it's obviously bad for those families. Jim. Jim. So if the President is going to stick to his position, and the Speaker of the House is going to come over here and stick to his position, what's the point of having a meeting? Well, uh, the, the, you know, the, leader, the Republicans you know, keep saying they want to negotiate, they want to meet. Why isn't the President meeting with them? He is meeting with them. He has called them. Uh, he has, again, met with and spoken with Speaker Boehner uh, quite a bit during the time that John Boehner has been Speaker of the House. Uh, often, uh, in earlier days, uh, uh, quietly, uh, and... Uh, that won't read out to the press, I guess. Precisely. And for a variety of reasons, and I'll, you can surmise what they might be or who put them forward. But the fact of the matter is, this is not about taking, the, the President's only position is that the government ought to be open. The President's only position is that the full faith and credit of the United States uh, must be maintained. He's not asking the Republicans for anything in return for them doing their jobs. He's not attaching any partisan or personal agenda item to that responsibility. And so when it's like, the position the Republicans have had, and, and it was articulated by the Speaker at one point earlier this week, is that, you know, you know, give us what we want or we'll shut down the government. And you can't, it's, the opposite is not true. The President hasn't asked for anything. And it's not a concession to the President of the United States, regardless of his or her party, to open the government. It's not a concession to the President of the United States, whether he or she is a Republican or a Democrat, to pay our bills and not default and not, you know, trash our economy. That's not a concession. And is it possible that what we might see happen over the next week or so is that essentially a continuing resolution will be packaged <coughs> together with an increase to the debt ceiling? I mean, is that sort of the deal that potentially could happen in the coming days? Is that something that might be discussed uh, this afternoon? Again, I'm not I, I, going to speculate about how Congress goes about ensuring that we don't default except to say that they have to get about the business of ensuring that we don't default. That sounds like a good thing to the President, though, something like again, that? Again, I'm not going to... Uh, again, the, the mechanics of how they do the right thing, uh, I'll leave to them as long as they do the right thing. And the right thing is not to threaten default. And the, to follow Kristen's question uh, about the President's pay, uh, the Attorney General, Eric Holder, said he would cut his own pay earlier this week. Why doesn't the President just do the same? Again, I'd like, I, obviously, individuals can make decisions, and I don't have anything for you on uh, on the president at this time, but I think it's important to understand that uh, when the shutdown happens, there are accepted employees who have to work and they are guaranteed in the future that they'll be paid for that work. And then there are those who are furloughed uh, and they will not ever get paid unless Congress acts to, you know, for the time that they were uh, furloughed, unless Congress acts, as I understand it, unless con Congress acts, as it has in the past, in previous shutdowns, I believe, uh, to uh, make them whole, but uh, so it's a little it's a little different from, for example, because of the uh, sequester and the furloughs associated with that, where people took people who uh, were accepted and had to work but took pay cuts uh, that were mandated as part of that. And on the Asia trip, just very quickly, uh, the president and uh, President Putin, who will be out in Asia for this trip as well, uh, in Bali uh, for that summit. I was just curious. The president and President Putin have had this sort of almost debate over American exceptionalism in recent weeks. What does it say about American exceptionalism? The president goes overseas while the government is shut down and is at the risk of defaulting on its debts. Again, the, the government is shut down today by a simple decision of the Speaker of the House to allow the House to vote to open the government. It could be open tomorrow. Uh, so, you know, you're throwing out a hypothetical that we don't know will come to pass. And as I said earlier in answering questions about uh, the President's trip and the scheduling changes to it, you know, we'll evaluate uh, the rest of the trip that's still on the schedule uh, as each day goes by. Thanks, Jay. David, last Jay, one. Jay, a couple on immigration. Um, the White House endorsed the Senate's comprehensive immigration bill. As we all know, you've been urging uh, Speaker Boehner to bring that forward for a vote and saying it would pass if it was voted on the House floor. Uh, today, House Democrats introduced their own version of a bill that stripped out a lot of the strongest border security language out of that. They're saying it's time to move in a different direction, try to, uh, you know, gain traction on a different kind of plan. I'm wondering if the White House endorses either that, I don't know if you've seen the, that bill, 
that the House Democrats I haven't seen that bill. We certainly support uh, passage of the bill that the Senate passed. We support comprehensive immigration reform. As you know, the bill that the Senate uh, did I say the House? I meant the Senate. That the Senate passed. Uh, the bill that the Senate passed obviously wasn't word for word the way the President would write it. And it, and it contained uh, significant increases in funding for border security and other measures that were aimed at border security. Uh, so much so that I think John McCain at the time said, Senator John McCain, Republican of Arizona, at the time said uh, that anybody who is opposing this bill uh, uh, on the argument that it doesn't address the issue of border security is not being sincere, and I'm paraphrasing because it's been a long time since I've seen the quote, but I think he would accept that paraphrase uh, because the Senate bill does address in substantial way border security uh, and builds on the enormous strides that we've made uh, in the last five years uh, on border security. Again, I don't have but specific- But Democrats seem to be saying, you know, that's dead here. We've got to try something else. Do you endorse that idea? Well, again, again I, I don't, I, I think that it is up, I, I would encourage the Speaker of the House, uh, similarly, to put the Senate bill on the floor. It's already passed the Senate. Put the Senate bill on the floor of the House and see how it does. A lot of Republicans believe uh, that passing that bill and allowing comprehensive immigration reform to become the law of the land would not only do uh, significant good things for our economy and for our businesses and for the middle class, uh, but would uh, do some political good for the Republican Party. I bet if he I haven't looked at this in a while, but if he put that bill on the floor of the House, it would get a majority and significant numbers of Republicans. So, but I don't want to. Again, David, you keep trying to ask me about a bill I said I haven't seen. What I what I'm saying is, uh, the House ought to pass comprehensive immigration reform. Final thing, uh, just for the I mean, for the president though, he, I think almost 11 months ago now in his first news conference after winning re-election, he said, you know, we got to seize the moment on immigration. Is mm -hmm. is the moment gone? And is the president going to get back to talking about this in any you know substantial way in the next? Uh, the moment isn't gone. We saw remarkable things happen in the Senate. We saw a substantial bipartisan majority pass comprehensive immigration reform that meets uh, the principles laid out there by the President. Not word for word what he would have necessarily written himself, but it, it meets his standard and he would sign it. And we've called on the House to act. And I think uh, perhaps as the Republican Party sees its you know, approval in the eyes of the public continue to dip and Congress sees its approval in the eye of the pu public continue to dip, that maybe they want to take some action uh, to address that problem, uh, and uh, once they go about the business of reopening the government, and once they make sure uh, that uh, we will not default in a responsible way without drama and delay, uh, they could take up comprehensive immigration reform and do themselves some good. Thanks very much. Anyone beyond the first two rows? Yeah. On that proposition and see what happens. If he's convinced that a majority, that all of his Republicans in his conference will vote no to opening the government to a clean CR in Washington speak, to just a bill that opens the government and funds it at the levels that it has been funded for the previous year, uh, then, then we'll see what we do then. But my guess is, and the estimation of numerous observers and members of Congress of the Republican Party is that if John Boehner, the Speaker of the House, who has this power alone, put on the floor of the House a bill to fund the government, to open it up without partisan strings attached, it would pass overwhelmingly. I think you know that's true. I think every member of Congress knows it's true. Uh, and it reflects the simple fact uh, that, unfortunately, the Speaker won't do that because he is responding to the demands of one faction, of one party, in one house, of one branch of government. And everyone is paying the price of that decision. So that position of the president is pretty well known at this point. So if he's not uh, budging off of that, going to this meeting, what's the purpose of having the congressional leaders here? Uh, look, the president said, uh, and he is true to his word, that he would be having conversations with the leaders of the Congress about the essential need to keep the government open, or now in this case to reopen the government, and to uh, ensure that we do not default. Uh, and he will have that conversation. And uh, you know, we look. We all realize he, you know this has put the Republicans. You know, they've gotten themselves in a box here in the House, and it's put them in a uh, 
difficult position and they're under a lot of pressure, a lot of it applied by Republicans. Uh, and negotiation in the Washington sense traditionally implies give and take, trade-offs, demands, uh, you know, if you give me this, I'll take that, I'll give, I'll give you that. The President's approach from the beginning in this uh, is that he's asking for nothing, nothing from Republicans. He is attaching zero demands to the general proposition that Congress should simply open the government, keep it open. He's asking for nothing. He is making no demands. He is attaching no partisan strings to his request that Congress fulfill its responsibility to ensure that the United States does not default on its obligations for the first time in our long history. So in that sense, uh, no, the President is not going to sit down and start asking for puts and takes. He's not going to engage in that kind of negotiation because he does not want uh, to hold or have held the, the openness of the government, the functioning of the government, or the world and American economy <laughs> hostage to a series of demands. Uh, you know, what the President is asking the Congress to do, what the President is asking Republicans in the House to do, is quite literally the least they could do. He is asking them to extend funding at the levels set in the previous fiscal year to keep the government open. That's the least they could do. And the Speaker of the House should hold a vote. There's a simple way out. Do the Democratic thing. Pass a bill. See if it can win a majority. Put a bill on the floor. See if a majority votes yes. Be surprised and delighted by the fact that a number of your own Republicans would vote yes, by some estimates, quite a number of them. Take that as a win uh, and move on. And then we can uh, ensure that the government doesn't, uh, rather that the economy doesn't default, the United States doesn't default. Uh, we raise the debt ceiling in an orderly fashion without drama and delay. And then we can go about debating and discussing and negotiating our budget priorities. How do we move forward? How do we fund the government in a way that assures that our economy continues to grow, that the, uh, the, the jobs that have been created thus far in this uh, recovery, seven and a half million private sector jobs, are added to uh, as soon as quickly as possible with more private sector jobs. Uh, and, you know, put to votes, you know, different propositions about how we should do that. Have negotiations, discussions, put it to a vote. Uh, but do not, I mean, it is profoundly undemocratic for uh, you know, one faction of one party to say, I didn't get what I wanted through the normal legislative process. I didn't get what I wanted uh, through the Supreme Court. I didn't get what I wanted when the American people nationally voted. And so I will therefore hold the government hostage and the economy hostage uh, in order to achieve my aims. I don't think that's good for our democracy, and it's certainly not good for our economy. And I think you heard uh, Lloyd Blankfein, who's the head of the Financial Services Forum, you know, say that you cannot use U.S. obligations to repay it. Uh, before I take your questions, uh, let me uh, offer a few things. First, uh, the President earlier today had another uh, update on the shutdown and uh, the uh, issue of the need to raise the debt ceiling. Uh, again, uh, the participants in that meeting were the Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Sylvia Burwell, and Deputy Chief of Staff, Alyssa Mastromonaco. The President, as you know, met with members of the Financial Services Forum, the President and the Vice President did, and I think you had an opportunity to uh, hear from some of them at the stakeout not long ago. Uh, 
and I hope you took note of what was said. <coughs> Furthermore, the President will meet with uh, the four leaders of Congress at 5.30 p.m. today in the Oval Office with the Vice President. The Secretary of the Treasury, Jack Lew, will, in that meeting, uh, brief the leaders on what were the impacts of the threat of default in 2011 and the uh, economic imperative for Congress to act to raise the debt ceiling without the threat of default and without delay and drama uh, uh, shortly. With that, I'll take your questions. Any coverage on that? Uh, it's a meeting with the leaders. No follow-up? Yeah. Uh, I don't have anything for you on that, more. Thanks, Jay. Um, the meeting today, is that something we should be looking at as a negotiation on the government shutdown, or is this more about the President gathering these leaders in the Oval Office to just tell them what we've heard from him publicly for the past few days? I think I can answer your question this way. I know it's debt as a cudgel. Uh, and there's a consensus. This is, again, uh, quoting him based on reports I've seen. I was not out at the stakeout. But there's a consensus that we shouldn't do anything to hurt this recovery. And that's a consensus among, you know, CEOs who might not otherwise all agree politically with the President, because this isn't about, that shouldn't be about partisan politics. We keep the government open. We pay our bills. We yes. Move on to the Asia trip. Um, oh, come on! It was, I was, it was <laughs> just getting started. <laughs> You'll have another opportunity, I'm sure. Um, the cancellation of the two stops was presented as sort of a logistical decision, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if there's also any concern here about just the optics of having the president be abroad during a shutdown, and when the final decision on the Indonesia and Brunei legs needs to be made. By. Well, you're right that it was a logistical decision related to the shutdown, and it was because of where uh, assets were and people were and the fact that they had not been deployed to those two countries where th which were scheduled to be at the back end of the trip, and therefore because of the shutdown it made it uh, logistically necessary to cancel those two stops. We had assets and personnel in the first two countries, uh, and as of now we, uh, you know, continue to intend, we intend to have the President make those uh, you know, make that make that trip because uh, it is we important. It is make that trip whether or not the government is shut down. Look, we we Saturday. think. Well, again, I'm not going to get spin ahead to Saturday, and we'll obviously evaluate this as uh, each day goes by. You know, if the speaker were to do what I just talked about, we could the government would be up and running by uh, uh, by dinner time. So, uh, so there remains the opportunity here for that. You know, hypothetical to be moot, and we hope that it is because you know it's an important 